in conservation for over, over 50 years, uh, beginning after Earth Day, um, as he was serving as an active volunteer with the Sierra Club. In 92, he moved in uh, to the Sierra Club National Headquarters, where he was the director of the Sierra Club, or Sierra Club Centennial Campaign. Uh, after that, he served uh, as president of the Wilderness Society from December of 96 to May tw uh, 2012. During his tenure at TWS, uh, more than 5 million acres of wilderness were added to the National Wilderness Preservation System. Um, he's since retired and he's continued his commitment to building partnerships and building new constituencies into the wilderness movement. Um, he currently serves as an, as an honorary member of the Governing Council uh, and and a senior uh, program advisor for the Wilderness Society, like he mentioned just before. Um, he's also the past chairman of the Green Group, the Campaign for America's Wilderness and the Partnership Project. He continues to serve in emer emeritus status on the boards of the League of Conservation Voters, Island Press, the Conservation Lands Foundation, and the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, where I'm so happy he's serving and uh, has been a great friend and mentor to me uh, during this transition period. Um, he continues to serve as a friend of the, Wilder the Alaska Wilderness League, the, the National Wildlife Refuge Association, and to the Great Old Broads for Wilderness. Um, please join me in welcoming Bill Meadows. Thanks, Bill. Take it from here. Eric, uh, that's very, very nice, very gracious. And Randy, thank you um, very much for handling all of the um, scheduling and logistics. Um, it is, it's really an honor to be part of this. Uh, I have been uh, blessed by being friends to many of you on the call. And uh, it may be a few years since uh, I've seen you. Uh, my wife and I have moved to Nashville, moved about two years ago from Washington. And uh, I still try to keep my hand in uh, the wilderness community when I, when I can. Uh, I wanted to reflect just a moment on the, the comments or the uh, talks earlier. I just, I thought they were spot on. And, uh, you know, first of all, I was, I was pleased for Peter to be out and speaking about the Bureau of Land Management. I think most of the program so far is really focused on the Forest Service. And certainly what the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards does has been uh, up until this year has been exclusively working with the U.S. Forest Service in wilderness areas in the Southeast. Um, this year we are, um, we are adding work in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So that's the first time we've gone over to the Interior Department to, uh, to try to help them. But um, I, one, of the, um, one of the points I wanted to make early is that um, uh, I've been fortunate to work with a number of organizations that have guided me in what I would describe as the elements of good conservation stewardship. And uh, one of those has been um, the Conservation Lands Foundation, on whose board I serve as emeritus and still actively engaged really in, in their work. And um, I've spent an enormous amount of time working on wilderness issues in the, in the West through BLM uh, and through the Conservation Lands Foundation. Um, the, uh, uh, my, my beginnings, as, as uh, Eric pointed out, I was a volunteer leader for the local Sierra Club in Tennessee. I was uh, the Middle Tennessee chair, uh, uh, group chair and on the Sierra Club executive committee for the state. And it's the first time I really learned about wilderness. The uh, Sierra Club was, uh, the Tennessee Sierra Club was really actively engaged in the Eastern Wilderness Act of 1975. And, and it really participated fully in the wilderness designations that occurred in 1984, 1986. So uh, my, my uh, first uh, visit to a, a wilderness area was actually one of the smaller wilderness areas uh, in, in the Forest Service, G Creek in uh, the Cherokee National Forest uh, many, many years ago. So uh, I come to wilderness uh, from, <laughs> from about 50 years ago in a modest way, but working with the Wilderness Society you know, put me in uh, full force. Um, and I wanted to thank Mark. I, reflecting on the Eastern Areas Wilderness Act, one of the 
one of the first advocacy efforts that the wilderness community had to undertake was to convince the Forest Service that there actually was qualified wilderness in the eastern United States. Uh, most of the forest had been um, uh, cut over. Uh, there certainly was very little old growth in, and uh, the areas that were um, fairly wild were very small. And uh, uh, it, took, it took time. Uh, one of my first friendships in the wilderness community is somebody that Lynn and Mark will uh, remember well is Ernie Dickerman. He was working for the Wilderness Society on the Eastern Areas Wilderness Act. And he, you know, he influenced me greatly on the way in which you do this work. And the theme that, uh, that, uh, that I have learned over the years is that all of this is local. Uh, we're looking at specific places. We're making a case for those specific places. Um, am I still on the screen? Yeah, you're good, Bill. Okay, well, I, can't, I can't see myself now. Um, but everything we do is local. And Mark made the, made that, that, the case that um, uh, one of the first advocacy efforts that the wilderness community had to undertake was with the Forest Service itself. Uh, you know, he was asked, uh, when is the last time you worked on a trail? You work on designating these wilderness areas and then leave them alone. You don't help us maintain them. And um, that, you know, that has changed dramatically in the last 50 years and uh, it, or 45. And it is, um, uh, it's at the heart of what we do now. I would, I would suggest that perhaps the most important advocacy efforts we undertake are with the agencies with whom we work. And that has moved from being, uh, a relationship that was begun with skepticism to one that is now a full partnership. And I don't think there's any organization that has a better working relationship than, than SAWS has with Region 8 leadership in the, in the Forest Service in the Southeast. So uh, we would not be doing what we uh, are doing now if it were not for the full support and partnership of the, uh, of the Forest Service. Um, I also wanted to uh, comment on um, Andy's comment, uh, Andy's uh, presentation. Um, the, perhaps the you know, most important conservation legislation uh, that's been passed in the last 20 or so years is the Great American Outdoor Act and the Land and Water Conservation Fund permanent renewal in uh, 2018 or 2019. Um, this, this effort uh, signifies the importance of local participation by conservation organizations. You know, I remember working on the Land and Water Conservation Fund the first year I came to the Wilderness Society in 1996. We were trying to get a full funding, uh, full appropriate uh, full authorization and appropriations for $900 million a year was present, but we never could get the full uh, authorization. And so we had literally 3,000 different organizations working in local communities, trying to convince their local representatives, their local members of Congress for full funding. Uh, it took a long time and I, you know, in, in large measure due to the, the uh, leadership of Lamar Alexander, uh, both of those pieces of legislation passed in his uh, his last year in uh, in the Senate, and uh, his love for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and for uh, the um, Cherokee National Forest, I think, were um, at the heart of uh, of um, the efforts that he undertook. Um, Lynn uh, ended her presentation with the comment. Stewardship is political power. And uh, if you remember in her presentation, she, uh, she focused on two themes of collaboration and then action. Actually, she said collaborate and ask, but it is making the case and then asking somebody to join you and being able to bring uh, people together perhaps in compromise, but certainly around common themes and common interest. Uh, she mentioned my friend Bart Kohler as being instrumental in 
bringing the mountain bike community and the wilderness community together um, in the um, in the Virginia wilderness um, efforts. Bart was a master at compromise and bringing finding common ground for people, and he was patient. Um, one of the themes that I've one of the uh, elements of uh, conservation that I've learned is you have to be uh, patient but persistent, and Bart was certainly that. Um, I think um, I'd like to move to um, I think I'd like to move to Saws and give um, a little bit of a story here. Now, um, I thought I'd start by giving you what I would describe as the origin story. And then we'll move to look more specifically at some of the things that Saws has done and uh, how we do our work. Um, at the heart of the, the beginnings of Saws is the Tennessee Wild Campaign. It was a small, uh, wilderness campaign, mostly additions to the existing wilderness in the Cherokee National Forest. Um, the two leaders in the Senate, one leader in the Senate was Lamar Alexander, the leader in the House was Phil Rowe, who is Congressional District 1 up around Tri-Cities area in, uh, in Tennessee. Um, they were enthusiastic about the, um, the legislation, but they both uh, did not want to have to deal with any um, opposition. <laughs> and so uh, it, it turned out that we had this guy um, working in, uh, actually he's working at the time, he's working for the Southern Appalachian for, um, um, Forest Council, SAFC, and uh, ultimately ended up with uh, Wild South uh, dealing with the Tennessee Wild Campaign. And uh, he began to uh, try to bring people together and found that the greatest opposition to this wilderness bill in Cherokee came from the trail clubs. They did not understand how they were going to take care of the trails if they were designated, if they were in designated wilderness. They had no experience with crosscut saws. Uh, most of them were older, uh, sort of in my vintage. And, uh, um, felt um, uncomfortable trying to learn cross-cut saw. They were very familiar with going in and managing the trails with uh, chainsaws. And so it took a while, but Bill Hodge uh, took this project on and decided that he could teach people uh, how to use a cross-cut saw. And he, he began by bringing all of the trail, as many of the trail groups as he could together for a uh, a two-day conference, and they sat and talked about the issues, and he convinced them that they, if they would spend some time, he would show them how they could do this work, and you know, it took a little bit of time, but we ended up with full support from all the trail organizations, and so ultimately we were able to pass the Tennessee Wilderness Bill thanks to Bill. Um, the Wilderness Society thought his idea was so strong and good that uh, we asked him to come to work for us, and so he did, and he was an important um, uh, leader for the Wilderness Society in the southeastern United States for um, uh, many years until he left to go to the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. And, uh, uh, but this organization is really built on Bill's shoulders and his brain and uh, energy and enthusiasm. So uh, I give credit to that. I happen to be uh, president of the Wilderness Society at this time. I happen to be... Uh, I, I, I would like to say I'm a friend of Lamar Alexander, but I certainly I certainly spent a lot of time with him, and uh, he was one of my advocacy targets all for the entire time I was at uh, when, from the time that he uh, he came into the Senate in 2003. So uh, I got to know him very very well, and uh, you know it was the efforts to change to support him and support the Tennessee Wilderness Bill that really began SAWS. Um, the, um, the organization has thrived uh, in large measure because of Bill, but more because of the great partnerships that we've developed over the years, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, the uh, Forest Service, of course, um, and the local organizations, uh, Lynn mentioned the, the uh, Virginia Wilderness Committee, uh, these are all the, you know, these are groups that we, uh, we could not, we wouldn't be doing the work with that, those 
organizations and those organizations wouldn't be accomplishing the goals that they've set without SARS. So uh, I think it might be useful. Uh, Eric, if, you, if we could turn to just a few slides and let me speak from those a little bit to give you a better sense of where SARS works, what we do, and maybe some of the success that we've had. So you know, first of all, sure thing, it's Bill. Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. And so, you know, by definition, we were working in the Southern Appalachian region. Uh, almost all of our, I don't see the slides, but uh, Eric. Yeah, Bill, I'm pulling them up. And just a time check, we're going to be moving uh, to the other presentation here uh, soon at 4.05. So just keep in mind your time check here. Okay. <clears throat> Well, just to make certain that everybody understands, um, we are in this, we are in Region 8. We've been working in this, um, Southern Appalachian wilderness areas. Um, uh, you can see the states there that we are working in, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, West Virginia, and a little bit in Kentucky. Uh, we just added Arkansas. And as uh, noted, uh, we added Great Smoky Mountains National Park to that list. Uh, uh, the 10 national forests, um, 75 wilderness areas, about you know, 700, um, over 700,000 designated wilderness uh, acres. So it's a really expansive effort and it's, um, it's um, uh, uh, quite an honor to be working in each of those. Um, how do we work? There are, there are really uh, three, there are four different areas in which we spend time. One, we, are, we, we try to make certain we're, providing wilderness rangers in as many wilderness areas as we possibly can. Um, they have education um, responsibilities, trying to meet people on the trail and give them better understanding of uh, the wilderness designation and what you expect in wilderness and uh, leave no trace opportunities. Uh, the, uh, in addition, they're doing wilderness monitoring with the Forest Services approval, looking at trail assessments and really trying to understand better uh, how uh, wilderness is being um, uh, managed or overused or uh, where there is uh, uh, investment needed. And second, uh, we work with uh, wilderness specialists who, can you bring the next slide up, Eric? Yeah, the, it's, I think there's just a delay here, Bill. Here we go. Um, so wilderness specialists have really, as, as noted in the title, they are really working on research and making certain that we are doing the uh, wilderness characteristics and finding that, uh, trying to help the Forest Service really make the case that uh, for the, uh, for the um, uh, stewardship efforts that are, that are needed and make the case really for ourselves for continuing to do the work. Uh, the third uh, area that really takes the, the most energy is um, uh, uh, managing a series of uh, field crews. Those are six person crews that are out for, um, they do a hitch for several days, come back in, go back out, come back in. Uh, one of the things that I realized early on is that if you were trying to go deep into a uh, wilderness area, you would have trouble doing it with uh, a chainsaw and the uh, uh, gasoline you need to, to run it. Uh, uh, it's a lot easier to do this work with a chainsaw. Uh, the guys that are and women who are doing this work with our trail crews are just fantastic. They uh, they're well trained. They know what they're doing, and they do some extraordinary work. Uh, and you can see here doing. Uh, I'm not certain whether they're putting in a ledge or whether they're putting in a stairwell, but it is you know, it is a big uh, a big effort, and it takes it takes some strength. Uh, I'm really impressed. The last thing I wanted to mention um, uh, is the. Um, uh, the wilderness. Um, I'll come back. I'll come to this one in just a second. I, I do want to mention the Wilderness Skills Institute, which we do with uh, the Forest Service and Appala Appalachian Trail Conservancy. It's um, uh, it's a major, major project. And bring me to the next slide, if you would, Eric. Um, I've got it noted here on our sort of. These are the measures of success, I think, for for SAWS that, um, but we've had um, over 200 employees and. You know, these are people who are wilderness advocates, you know, that have come through, spent time on the ground, 
uh, really have had a positive experience in the outdoors, some of whom came into a, a field crew for the first time, the first time they'd been camping or been on a trail at all. And they come out with an expertise. Um, they're now, um, uh, as uh, Greg, uh, as Eric has listed here, the 13, uh, let me, I need to get my glasses out here, sorry. Um, there are 13 former staff members who have permanent positions at the federal land management agencies. We've got um, um, former employees who are uh, engaged in environmental advocacy right now across the, uh, the Southeast, uh, just from their experience with us learning the, uh, the uh, need for advocacy and having enough information to be able to do outreach. Um, the um, probably, I think the mo one of the most important things we do is engaging volunteers, people who come in for maybe a day of work on a Saturday, uh, but managing that over a thousand volunteers have done that. Um, the program we've had with the Naval, Ed uh, Naval Academy, uh, it, um, it qualifies as a leadership program for the Naval Academy. And so they're, they've, um, they've worked with us for four or five years now. And uh, it's really a remarkable effort. They're doing work in the uh, George Washington National Forest, as, um, as Lynn said. Um, and um, when this work actually boots on the ground, doing work that is critical to the Forest Service and to the National Forest and to the wilderness areas themselves, ends up being such a catalyst for leadership and such a great education for young people, mostly under the age of 30, um, who uh, turn around and go out and are great spokespeople for wilderness. And it is that, um, that role that SAWS plays in building an advocacy team for wilderness that has been hugely effective in reaching out to local county commissioners, mayors, uh, state representatives, members of Congress, senators, and we're able, to, we're able to focus our advocacy on the political leadership and the business leadership, the community leadership in the places where we work. And we're able to expand that. And when I think about advocacy, advocacy for wilderness, the best avenue for doing that is through stewardship. It's a structural way in which you can get people into the woods, into the wilderness areas to experience it themselves and come back and tell their friends and tell the leaders in those communities. Uh, I wanna end with one story. Um, we were working on what turned out to be the omnibus uh, lands bill of uh, 2009. There were about, I don't know, about two and a half million acres of wilderness added to the system in that one, that one legislation, it, it covered the entire country. But there was uh, one, uh, our, re our regional, the Wilderness Society's regional director in uh, Idaho uh, was a guy named Craig Gierke. And he had spent 25 years working on wilderness protection for the Hawaii Canyons. And he did that you know, throughout the year, anytime he had a free weekend, he went out to the Hawaii Canyons and tried to uh, find somebody to talk to about the wilderness uh, proposal. He called it his 1,000 cups of coffee campaign. He would go into a cafe, sit down, anybody there, he'd start talking. And it took a long time, but uh, it takes that. And, you know, the kind of work that Mark Miller has been doing, the kind of work that uh, Lynn Cameron has been doing in local communities in building support, uh, it is because of their passion, their enthusiasm, and they don't give up. <laughs> you know, they, they are patient and persistent. And I want to thank them. And I want to thank everybody here on this call who has um, demonstrated those skills as well. And I think we have a strong wilderness system because of the work of the individuals who are participating in this conference. So thank you. Back Thanks, to you, Bill. Randy. Derek? Yeah, Bill, um, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. 
Jeremy, I'm not sure how to pull those up, but um, just wanted to check. Um, um, there were the two questions in the Q&A that responded already. One was about the paid versus volunteer crew status with installs. Yeah, and um, thanks, Sandy, for that question. We have a mix of paid and volunteer crews. Um, the, the way it all started really was uh, um, with uh, mostly volunteer crews um, and kind of building off of that, um, the advocacy that, that Bill mentioned. Uh, and then over time, we sort of moved into paid crews and then our, our Naval Academy crew is all volunteer. Um, so great question. Bill, I have a question for you. Um, what, what would you say, you know, I hear you say sort of at, relationship building and advocacy within the forest service and land managers. Um, what, are, what are ways that, you know, stewardship groups can show up and, uh, and advocate for what they see as necessary to the, our partners with the, the land managers? The plan management agencies? Well, I, I think they're uh, making certain that we're having a great working relationship and a great uh, partnership with the uh, agencies is critical. But ultimately, in order for us to be successful in defending and promoting wilderness, we have to build in the local communities. And um, I mean, my experience with the Sierra Club is such that, you know, we had people living in you know, 30 different communities in the eastern part of the state of Tennessee, and somebody knew somebody in every, every one of those communities. And so we, we did a slideshow and we did um, uh, created an opportunity for us to provide a program for civic groups and churches. Um, and we actually did not have much trouble finding people who are willing to at least hear the story. Um, ultimately, you have to develop relationships with the political leadership at the local level. And uh, I, I have been convinced that uh, wilderness designation is not, it has not been a partisan issue. Uh, we've been able to pass uh, wilderness legislation, mostly in places that have Republican um, members of Congress now. Um, and so it's, you know, I wouldn't be scared by the political, political, political divide that we have in the country right now. I think, you know, uh, if you know someone in any community that you can talk to, that person's going to know two others and they're going to know four others. And eventually you're going to find 10 people in that community who have personal relationships with political leadership. And that's where you have to, but it takes a strategy and it takes time. You know, it's going back time after time after time. Lynn talked about 20 years. Mark, you know, is 20, 25 years or so at least. And, I, you know, it's just, um, it just takes um, that kind of persistent and your willingness to talk to anybody and answer questions. Sometimes people are not going to like you. But most of the time, you're going to find somebody who will sort of look up and say, you know, this makes some sense. And being able to bring the, hunting community into a relationship, being able to bring the mountain bike community into a relationship, uh, it, makes it, um, uh, makes it a lot stronger. Um, there, there are a lot of people who are participating in outdoor recreation, whether they're canoeing or hiking or climbing and uh, you know, building relationships with those groups at the local level are really critical too. So, you know, look for the outdoor uh, 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 recreation companies that are selling uh, outdoor goods, tents and shoes and poles and so forth, and uh, make certain you're in com conversation with them. And um, I just, you know, I, I think it is pretty exciting to get into one of those campaigns and you begin to make friends and it ultimately happens. Great, thanks. Um, if there's any more, oh, Peter Irvin asked, "What's your background, Cena? What's 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 your background from?" Banana Hala. <laughs> Banana Hala. Yeah. Uh, in in, uh, in Western North Carolina. On, I'm on a call tonight with the Alaska Wilderness League, and I've got uh, Denali back backdrop. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm strategic in my. There we go. There we go. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, it's been a delight to talk to you and um, and we've all learned a lot, I think, during your presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you for your help, Eric. I appreciate it very much. Oh, sure. Uh, Randy and or Ian. I'm here. We should have Randy back in a second. Great. I believe the next one is recorded. Stand by. Hey folks. Andrew, um, I think Randy is somehow locked out. <laughs> and okay. We'll Progress. see. We'll see. Uh, Jeremy, if you can add Anders Reynolds as a panelist, I'm suddenly I'm not able to um, I can see all the panelists, but I can't see the attendees list. I just added uh, Anders. Thank you. And Mark Miller should be promoted to panelist as well. Bill yeah, it's, it's, it's telling me that uh, my video isn't working because it's been stopped. Somebody must not have liked your outfit. <laughs> they, they certainly I think they wanted me in a I think they wanted me in a suit <laughs> there you go we got you now Mark got you now, Mark. thank you Randy Welsh are you uh are you back with us I'm still on the phone listening to everybody can you hear me yeah I can hear you now yeah okay so yeah my um I guess my browser has crashed or my Zoom has crashed. So um, if you guys, Ian, I sent you the, the active link to the um, video. I'm not going to be able to show it. Um, if Anders is up, he also has a copy of it. Um, but we need to get Anders added as the added to the panel. Um, Bill Hodge, Mark Miller, yourself, Andrew. Um, so the four of you guys. So I'll be able to, to talk in the background, uh, but I You've need got all to those be folks. able to know that that video, video is queued up. So can you share your screen and uh, present the video, um, Ian? Uh, where did you Where did you send I me? I sent it to you. I, it's at Ian at wildernessalliance.org. Okay. So sorry, everybody in the audience, uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, somehow Zoom and my computer aren't locking each other today. We'll get that Ian, figured out for tomorrow. Ian, while you're doing that, I, oh, I apologize for, for interrupting. But while Ian's looking, I, I just want to take a few minutes. There's something I wanted to acknowledge before we begin. 
Um, and that's this panel's lack of diversity and inclusion. Um, <laughs> this panel came together quickly a few days ago when another panel failed. That's not an excuse for the lack of diverse vo voices you see before you, but rather just information. So I believe, and I, I think I speak for all the panelists here, that diversity is a, a strength and inclusion is a resiliency. And if there are qualities that the wilderness movement should strive for, it's strength and resiliency. Um, and I, I just thought it was important we acknowledge that before us five or six white guys talk at you. That's a very good point, Anders. And um, originally in this schedule, we had Senator Kane from Virginia who was going to speak to us uh, about wilderness in Congress. And unfortunately, because of the turmoil in, in D.C. and Congress right now with the infrastructure bill, the Build Back Better bill, um, his schedule has gotten changed. He's one of the leadership involved in helping to get that bill passed through Congress. So he was pulled in different directions um, and unfortunately wasn't able to join us personally today. But he did provide a video for us. And so we're working to get that queued up for for everybody, uh, where he talks about his uh, work in Congress for wilderness. So I think it's a real good video. Hopefully we can get that up and running in a second. And then we uh, worked with uh, our panelists today. Um, Bill Hodge, who you heard about, uh, used to be the executive director for the um, Society or the Southern Wilderness um, Appalachian Stewards, Southern Appalachia Wilderness Stewards. Um, Anders is now the executive director for the Bob Marshall Foundation, Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. Anders Reynolds, who you just heard from, from the Southern um, Environmental Law Center in Washington, D.C. Andrew Downs, who you've talked earlier today from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, and Bill Meadows, um, from exec past executive director for the Wilderness Society, who you've just heard from. And then Mark Miller, who's been instrumental in working with Congress on the Shenandoah Mountain and other Virginia Wilderness um, Acts. So we asked these gentlemen to come and to share some of their thoughts about working with members of Congress that would help enlighten um, our audience as to how to go about doing that. So um, Ian, have you, you located the link down in the messages in the string I sent you? Anders posted it to all the panelists. So let's see if... Um, I can do it. Let's try, let's try me and I'll try yeah. to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, Thanks, and, uh, share your screen. Share the yep. video. Got it. Uh, here we go. Okay, can you see the still? All right, here we go. Continue with the uh, thumbs up, Ian, till we know we're supersonic. Hey, everybody, Senator Tim Kaine. I'm sorry I can't be with you today to talk about Virginia's great outdoors and the importance of wilderness preservation. First off, I know this turned out to be a virtual event, but I hope you'll make it to Bravo someday if you haven't already visited the Star City. My wife is one. We have relatives in Roanoke, and we always love coming to Roanoke to visit friends and family. It's right on the Appalachian Trail. It's on the Blue Ridge Park. It's one of the best places to have a conference on outdoors issues, and it's such a special place to be in so many ways. I'm proud to have sponsored the Virginia Wilderness Additions Act, adding 5,500 acres to two existing wilderness areas in the George Washington National Forest. It's passed the Senate and the House separately in the past two years, and we're hoping this starts in line this year. Both houses can pass it in the Senate for the President's desk. In Virginia, we love our public lands. They're popular, but we are a fast-growing state that still has spirited debates about the best ways to manage working lands and preserve open space. About a decade ago, in the lead-up to the new George Washington Forest Management Plan, forest users in Virginia came together to see if they could preempt the usual battles and negotiate a deal. They started from this premise. There's a place for wilderness, for hiking and biking trails, for hunting and fishing, and for responsible and sustainable 
September and August. Mark Miller is the executive director of the Virginia Wilderness Committee, one of the most patient guys you'll ever meet. He spent many hours around a table with representatives of Virginia's forest products industry, hunters, hikers, bikers, state and local officials in the U.S. Forest Service. After several years of work, this group came up with a plan that required everybody to compromise, but also gave everyone something that they really wanted. When I was asked to introduce the bill, it was by environmentalists endorsing responsible timber production and timber producers endorsing wilderness. How could I say no to that? If you get these folks together asking for the same thing, you know it must be worthwhile. This is a time in politics when differences are fundamental on environmental issues, and compromise seems almost like a quaint, old-fashioned notion. The Virginia wilderness example shows us that it's possible. It's not always fast, not always glamorous, but it's worth putting in the work. Some of you in the virtual room today have been involved in that work, and please know that you have a strong supporter of land preservation in the Senate and me, and my colleague, Senator Mark Warner. Thanks so much for caring about wilderness, and best wishes for a productive conference today. That was great. Thank you, guys. Randy? Um, pass it back to you or Ian. It's not me. <laughs> I think Randy's muted. Yep, Randy is muted. And he can't see himself not talking, not be heard. Well, since Senator Kane mentioned by name the very patient Mark Miller, maybe we could start with him about some particulars with that campaign. And um, Mark, I don't know. Maybe it would be it would it, it maybe it would be enlightening for folks to hear sort of the story of your interaction with Senator Kane and the work you've done on the Hill in support of that bill. Yeah, actually, Anders, there's because of COVID, there's not been a whole lot going on up on Capitol Hill, so. I can say truthfully for the first time, and I think I'm coming up on two years, I have not been on Capitol Hill talking to members of Congress. But that doesn't mean that we haven't been. Um, we work very closely with Senator Kane's office on um, wilderness legislative issues. And the, the Virginia Wilderness Additions Act, which he referenced, um, that came about as a 10-year effort of discussions with a, a group of people who hate each other would probably be the best way to put it, uh, because we had timber people and game people, mountain bikers, wilderness advocates. And the one thing that we all brought to the table was a concept of pragmatism. And there was an understanding that you could create a win-win situation by just talking together around the table and that we could actually then to some extent help the Forest Service actually in their forest planning process. And, but that only works at the planning level. And then you come to the um, boots on the ground and we actually then work together successfully on a large landscape scale project. That then allowed us to go back to these folks and say, okay, we want to introduce some legislation. And that's where it took education because we had to have lots of meetings with Tim Kane's staff about what it was that the stakeholder collaborative for the George Washington National Forest was all about. And it was through that educational effort. And in, in one story in particular, I can, I can, I can, I, I will share here. This was Congressman Bob Goodlatte former Congressman Bob Goodlatte was never known as a fan of wilderness. And John Hancock, who was the president of the Virginia Forestry Association, Merrick Smith with the Nature Conservancy, um, myself and somebody from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, we had a meeting with his chief of staff. And John, the, the president of the Virginia Forestry Association started to advocate for wilderness. And then I started advocating for more management on the forest. 
And the poor woman was just so confused because we were not advocating for what we were supposed to be. But it was a really powerful message. And she actually started talking to some of her other um, uh, colleagues on the Hill. And her, when I, I, I saw her again a couple of weeks later on a completely different matter, and she remembered this conversation and she said, I talked to my colleagues and they could only wish that things were like, things like that were happening on the force. So I think the, 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 what, I, what I came away from that with is if you want wilderness, you have to create a big tent, particularly if you're working in, in the Southeast and out West in some of the more conservative states. And, but it is possible to make that big tent and you can bring that big tent with you to Washington, D.C., and it makes it very easy for your congressman to get under that tent, understanding that nobody's going to, be, that he's not going to have to take a lot of heat from anybody. So. That's, that's great, Mark. And I, and I think right now, probably useful to kind of go around to our panel and think about and share kind of best practices and working with. Congress, what's worked well uh, for you in the past, and then what um, what have been the outcomes of some of those practices? And I, I'm I'm looking at Bill Hodge and wondering if you want to start. I know a couple of stories uh, of Bill on the Hill, but just sharing um, your your best practices, things, the tips and tricks, um, and um, and where you've been successful in applying those. Sure. Um, you know, speaking specifically of the Hill, you know, there's about three different pieces of legislation that I've been involved in at some level or, or the other. Uh, the first was the first to pass was the National Forest Trail System Stewardship Act, uh, and and then my uh, my blood, sweat, and tears, of course, had gone into the Tennessee Wilderness Act. Gee, if, if you had told me that a president named Donald Trump would sign that bill into law, I would kick you in the teeth. But that's what happened. Um, and then finally. Uh, small role in making sure the Forest Service was included in the Great American Outdoors Act. But you know, I'll go back specifically to the Tennessee Wilderness Act. And I, and I think the biggest thing is learning to listen and pay attention to the details and the meetings, uh, knowing who you're talking to. Uh, and I guess the story I would tell is, is trying to get Congressman Phil Rowe on board. Uh, Bill Meadows and, and a gentleman named Will Skelton had gotten uh, Senator Mar Alexander to sponsor the bill on the Senate side, but we had no we had no bill on the House side, and it became pretty clear that we were not going to get the bill done without one on the House. But Congressman Rowe had made it very clear that he was only going to sponsor the bill if we dealt with some specific opposition from the Tennessee Eastman Hiking and Canoe Club, which is a a team maintaining club um, in Northeast Tennessee. Um, but I very remember him specifically saying, "But if you make them happy." I will introduce legislation. Uh, and it took four years, but we made the Tennessee Eastman happy and he followed through on that uh, promise. And, and then to sort of energize him beyond just introducing the bill, uh, Senator or Congressman Rowe was a, was a veteran himself of the army. He was at the time serving as chairman of the Veteran Affairs Committee in the House. Um, and we had a chance to get him on the ground in his district in a wilderness area that we were asking in addition for to meet with kids from the United States Naval Academy. Um, and that would have been great in and of itself. But we also made sure that we had three different local newspapers there to cover that moment uh, where Congressman Rowe got to meet with these soon to be active duty officers in the military himself as a, as a chair of the Veteran Affairs Committee. And of course, that all made it in these three different articles in these three different local newspapers. And I think that really energized uh, Congressman Rowe's commitment to, to not just introducing the bill. And, and much later, uh, as we were getting close to what it felt like our 15th finish line of getting the thing done, uh, I remember Anders asking me to make a trip back to Capitol Hill. I had just got back to my hotel room in D.C. I'd finally gotten out of that monkey suit and gotten the tie off my neck. and. Uh, I was asked to go back to his office to ask them for a very specific letter worded a very specific way to the committee that was that was negotiating, uh, the conference committee that was negotiating the final details of the bill. And that ask may have been the final straw that got the bill passed 
And I think that only happens. And it was a it was a nuanced ask that asked them to support the Senate version of the Tennessee Wilderness Bill. I don't think that happens if Congressman Rowe didn't have this personal, tangible connection. He'd been on the ground, seen these young people as stewards of these wild places. And, and it's how all of these things come together by paying attention to the details matter. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the story I thought I would share. And Anders could, of course, build on that. Yeah. Well, let me, I want to add a word about Phil Rowe. Um, my wife's from Johnson City, and that his, was his district, and he actually knew my in-laws. So that was a helpful uh, in entree. But um, the first time I went to his office, he had already, we had already been talking to him about, uh, or others had been talking to him. I had not seen him. But when I first went to his office and saw him for the first time personally, the first thing he wanted to do, and he literally had this in his file drawer, he pulled out the USGS maps of his district and he showed me all of the trails that he had walked on. And this is a guy that was an outdoors guy. I mean, he, he, is a, uh, he was an OBGYN physician, but uh, he spent a lot of time. His weekends were spent in the woods. And so, you know, that personal knowledge of the, the uh, landscape was really critical, I think, in his willingness to step up and be a leader. And uh, you don't find that everywhere, but um, I was going to make another comment about uh, about um, uh, uh, relationship with Tim Kaine and Mark's comments about uh, working with his staff. And the you know, I talked earlier about the important relationship of the partnership with the with the Forest Service and with the BLM. But if you don't have a if you don't have a personal relationship with the conservation specialist on a representative or senator staff, you're not going to make very much progress. And they're usually, I mean, they're, they're accustomed to people coming to talk to them about legislation. And if you're, if you're educating them, they want to, they want to talk to you. And I, you know, I have found some wonderful friends in there. Sometimes they don't always, uh, we don't always get to the right place, but most of the time we we are, are having a wonderful conversation, and that, that, you know, having a member of Congress or a senator personally engaged in keeping these groups together can be helpful. I would, you know, I think Tim Kaine actually has tried to help bring those groups together in other cases. So it's a, you know, having a personal involvement from a member of Congress or a senior staff person can advance the conversations every time. That's, that's a good point from both of you all that is, is to try and, and think about as a sort of tip and tr trick, really focus on people's relationship with the resource. These congressional representatives are human beings too. Many of them like to get out on the land. And so making sure you know that and can, and can use that information in your conversations, I think is a good one. Um, a good a good tactic, um, Anders. I, I don't I don't know. I want to open it up to you and see if you've got any other advice um, or reflections on things and techniques that have been worthwhile in your work on the hill. Uh, yeah, I do. Well, I, one of the reasons I like that that Phil Rose story that Bill Hodge tells so much is because it really demonstrates in the specific a lot of the advice I would offer in general, and you know I think. Some people watching probably attended our advocacy 201 group. And so I, you know, I repeat myself, but you know, the, the advice I give people going to the Hill is that, you know, there's 435 members of Congress and 100 senators. So there's 535 decision makers up there. And each one operates like a different small business. You've got 535 distinct small businesses. And it's your job to figure out how they operate. You know, some small businesses are really well run. Some are not so well run. Some have a really strong overbearing boss, like maybe the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. Others um, have a, uh, a really good crew of employees that's really making the whole thing hum. You know, some are members, some are members of trade unions. And, you know, on the Hill, that would sort of be like people that pay attention to their caucus. Others are completely independent minded and do their own thing. So, you, you know, there's not a cookie cutter one size 
fits all approach for these offices, you've really got to spend some time uh, figuring out what kind of office you're dealing with. It may be the kind of place where they know the subject matter and they want to help you and they've got a particular passion for wilderness and you know they've hiked the AT as it exists in Virginia and you feel like you're in pretty good shape. You know, in other places, you're going to have to do some work. Um, so, you know, it, it takes diplomacy and a lot of it. And I think that's what Bill Hodge experienced going back and forth between, you know, the Eastman Hiking Club and Phil Rowe and U.S. Naval Academy and Phil Rowe. And in the case of Mr. Rowe, I, I think two things really mattered for him. One is, as chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee, he actually had a, a genuine um, care and concern for veterans like that that was his his standard operating procedure was to care about the experience of our vets and I think knowing that many of them use the wilderness resource as a means of clearing their mind reconnecting to things I think that made it important to him secondly like I won't say all members of congress but 99 percent of members of congress he cared about being reelected. you've got to associate your cause with their re-election concern and in this case, it's pretty good press to have your name and face in a picture on the trail with the U.S. Naval Academy. I mean, that's just something that any Congress member is going to love. So the more that you can present the case that what you want is associated with their re-election, the better you are. And then finally, I would just say that that last example Bill gives of coming back and making a specific ask, it's always best to have a specific ask. You know, will you support? us, will you support wilderness, is not a specific ask. If for no other reason, then they can say yes, and you don't really know how they're going to. You've got to have an ask. Will you join a caucus? Will you sign a letter? Will you introduce a bill? Will you join us out on the trail? You can think of four or five different asks for a new member of Congress that you're talking to. Um, and then finally, I would just say, and I think everybody's been saying this, you, you got to know your subject matter. Um, when they ask a question, you got to be able to answer it. Um, or if you can't answer it, you've got to demonstrate that you can get the answer back to them quickly. So, I mean, those are, those are sort of the things I would have said anyway. They're all kind of perfectly demonstrated, I think, in, in the Phil Rowe example. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I just want to provide a little connection between what you all have said here, because I think there's a, there's a theme that ties everything a little bit together. You know, Bill talked about the importance of Bill and and Bill talked about the importance of getting on the land. And um, Anders talked about, you know, learning about the congressional office, not making any assumptions about how their offices run or maybe whether or not they'd like to get outdoors or not. And then also connecting it to um, their reelection campaign. And I think if you, if you find yourself motivated to work with congressional office that doesn't necessarily know a lot about trails or wilderness or things like that, uh, one way to connect them uh, to the resource through an understanding of their desire to get reelected is to bring in a steward from their district to join you in the conversations that you may be having. You know, my, I, I work with a lot of um, congressional representatives that, um, that are outside my district, so to speak. And so I'm not a voter, right? And, and if I can bring in somebody from their district who can who can speak knowledgeably about the resource um, there, who can talk about you know why advocacy or excuse me why stewardship is important to these resources, their relationship with the agencies, you can kind of bring some of that relationship to the to the resource with you um, through having a, a steward as a partner during your advocacy um, and making sure it's a voter. So that that's a way to kind of connect a lot of the different things that the panelists here are talking about. Um, yeah. that, go Andrew, ahead. If, I can, if I can give a real world example of how important that point you just made is, the, the day in which Phil Rowe gave us the specific direction, which is if you make the Eastman happy, I will support your bill. That meeting never happens. So the, the day we had a meeting set up with him, I took a guy named Jerry Greer, many of you in the Southeast know of Jerry, a uh, fantastic photographer, published a lot, of, a lot of books on the Blue Ridge Parkway and Southern Appalachia in general. Jerry lived in the first congressional district, which is Phil Rose district. I didn't, I lived in the third district, but on the day we had a meeting set up with him and I have Jerry in tow, Phil Rowe actually saved a guy's life in the Charlotte airport that morning. A guy had full cardiac arrest. 
and Phil Rowe, as, as Bill Meadows mentioned earlier, was a physician. He was an OBGYN, but he he was the guy who grabbed the AED off the wall at the Charlotte Airport, shocked this guy's heart back into functioning. Um, and so by the time we got to Phil Rowe's office, his his communications person said, yeah, he's not going to meet with you today because there was like eight CNN and MSNBC people outside. His, everybody was wanting to do this feel-good story about this physician who you know, saved this guy's life in the Charlotte airport. And I'm like, well, we're not going to get this. And Phil saw Jerry and pulled us into his office. And we spent an hour with him because I had a constituent who was, a, you know, was a steward, an advocate for the land. Um, and that was the day in which we got that piece of information, which is if you'll do X, I'll do Y. None of that happens if that meeting doesn't happen that day. It was my one time to get, you know, get Jerry to, to Washington, D.C. So that's a great point, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, want to ask um, any last call for questions in the chat, um, and I'll open it up to any of the other panelists just to just to reflect on things that have worked, techniques that have worked with them in the past, and maybe a little bit about the outcomes of those techniques. Um, and then we'll close up shop for today. Um, well, I've I've got a story, Andrew. Please. Um, I, I started working on the Capitol Hill, on Capitol Hill, shortly after George Bush was elected president. And I was walking around with a, a gentleman by the name of Larry Romans, who at the time worked for the Wilderness Society. And Larry and I were having lunch together. And Larry said, you know, Mark, one of the things you have to be really careful of is, you know, where you're speaking to people at. And he gave me the example of um, somebody was talking about a congressional staffer in the bathroom. And that congressional staffer overheard this conversation, recognized the voice, and he wasn't very happy about it. And I just never forgot about that. And one day we were sitting in a cafeteria at the on the house side. And we got to talking about a staff person. And I just happened to look over my shoulder and the staff person was sitting there. And, but he was all by himself. And I thought, okay, first we have to stop this conversation before it goes any farther. And second, I then excused myself from the table and I went over and I sat down and I started chatting with him. And it, it was really helpful, um, but be careful what you say when you're on the hill because you never know who you're gonna run into and, or, or who's going to be there to overhear you. And it's, you know, with all of the people that are up there, you, you just never have a clue as to who's there. And it's just something that I learned from Larry Romans that came in quite handy a couple of years later. It's a big, small town. Yes. It's a big, small town. Um, yeah, I, 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 these are all good, um, good reflections that I think as Anders says, said, you know, really reflect, um, on the webinar that we've had, you know, throughout the fall and then a lot of the, a lot of the, um, workshops that we had today. And I'll just reflect on one kind of obvious success, um, technique that we've had in the trails community that I think NWSA plays a, a pretty critical role on on moving forward for the wilderness stewardship community. You know, for Hike the Hill, and for, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with that, it, it's essentially when all the partner groups of the National Scenic and National Historic Trails come together in, in DC and do some collective coordinated advocacy. And I've been really encouraged through that process by the willingness and ability of let's say Ian, my, my friend out in California, to take and understand issues relative to the Appalachian Trail and bring those to bear in his conversations with the uh, delegation in California. And a coordinated effort uh, has really made, proved to be really beneficial because you know when I'm talking to Senator Kane, for example, or somebody and I bring up an issue, it's, it's great that he hears it from me, but if he also hears it from his colleagues in California, and said that it was important to them, even though it's maybe a Virginia issue, 
man, it really creates uh, a much stronger case. And so as, as a community of wilderness advocates, I really look for us to share information um, about the advocacy work that each of us are doing uh, within our network. And so when we do have those um, random sort of happenstance opportunities that Mark was talking about, or we are talking with um, folks like Phil Rowe, who are, we've had long-term uh, relationships with, uh, like Bill was suggesting, we can pre prevent, or excuse me, present a really sort of uniform and wide-reaching value of wilderness stewardship across, um, across political boundaries. And that really is a much stronger uh, strategy to get things done. They're hearing it from a community rather than from uh, an individual. So it's, as we, one of the outcomes or one of the goals here through our uh, years uh, spent on promoting advocacy within the wilderness stewardship community and then our work here at the National Wilderness Workshop is to continue to um, solidify and galvanize um, that community of stewards and advocates so we can continue to help each other, not only out in the woods, but also on the hill as we, as we look to make improvements to the um, wilderness stewardship community and system. Um, I'll, I'll welcome any last reflections from the panelists before, uh, before we knock it off here. Well, I would just say I, I, I recognize a lot of the names of the hundred and so participants that are listening in on this and that a lot of you may be saying that you've heard a lot of us talking about wilderness designation campaigns and how there's an intersection with stewardship, but there's an intersection of active stewardship with advocating for the fundamental elements of allowing us to do the stewardship work in wilderness. And, and there's been a recent great example of the community coming together to advocate for there still being a director of wilderness and wild and scenic rivers uh, in DC as an example. Um, and, and, and I have suggested this in some of the webinars we did le leading up to this, which is just, if you're gonna be a, an advocate for stewardship and as you go up the chain, if, you, if you've been talking to the district about something you'd like to see, a decision you'd like to see different, Make sure the district knows that's an issue for you before you take it to the forest. And make sure the forest knows it's an issue for you before you take it to the region. And make sure the region knows it's an issue for you before you take it to DC. And most importantly, make sure the agency as a whole knows it's an issue for you before you take it to Capitol Hill and try to see if you can get, whether it's legislation passed or just a phone call made by uh, an elected official. There should never be anybody in the agency caught surprised by the fact that you've made an ask as it relates to, well, let's say funding for wilderness torture performance program or wilderness character monitoring, that sort of thing. So before any of you tune out, think all oh, this is just about advocating for more acres to the system. Now, there's a whole lot of advocacy that, that we're doing everywhere from the district office all the way to a congressional office when it comes to making sure the wilderness program is funded. Great, Bill, thanks. Um, Ian, I will pass it to you for final announcements and a closeout. Final announcements, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thanks all for that really informative discussion. Um, I just posted in the chat too, that tomorrow at one Pacific, four Eastern will be another uh, presentation around advocacy work. But um, so thanks for that. So yeah, Randy, we'll, we'll get Randy back in the morning. I have no doubt. Um, but he just asked me to close out and remind folks um, tomorrow starts at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific with a coffee hour, um, kind of a meet and greet. And then uh, another robust set of presentations begins at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific tomorrow. So um, I think those were my only important announcements to close us out on a great first day of the 21 National Wilderness Workshop, even though I'm glad not to be in Roanoke. Well, we certainly miss you all. Um, thanks, everyone. There you go. That's, look at that hat. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to the people that we've got <laughs> online for your participation. Uh, really appreciate you being part of the 2021 National Wilderness Workshop. And um, until tomorrow, we'll say goodbye and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow around 11 o'clock uh, Eastern here. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks all for appreciate it.
Thank Take you care, much. everybody.